You know, um, I watched the video um, this week. Yeah, I, I, you thought we were, see, we, we, we fooled you again. But it's, it's relevant. It's relevant to this topic. Okay. And it was uh, a YouTuber that I occasionally watch. And she went back and watched her very first video because she had just hit, I think, 100,000 subscribers. Okay. And so it got to the end and she goes, oh, I haven't worked on an outro yet. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious I haven't done that probably. It took me a little while to figure out what I'm going to say. We're still working on that. <laughs> um, and so if you have any suggestions for us <laughs> to better and more gracefully exit out of these things, please let us know. Put them in the comments down below because we are definitely struggling. Uh, yeah. I was about to wrap it up and then you had more to say. Well, I had a tangent. You know, we talk about when that synapsis fires up there, I, I just gotta go with it sometimes. Are we done? Uh, I'm done synapsis heising. <laughs> made up word was that. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of This and That Coffee Chat with the Harris. I'm Kelly, this is my dad Scott. Hello. And I know there was a ton of stuff going on this weekend and I missed almost all of it. You so, have family in town. <laughs> we will get to that uh, here in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I have a list of just all the things that were going on that I did not see any of live. It was a uh, busy weekend as far as the world of sports goes mm -hmm. on, yeah. And some pop culture things that I have on my list. So. Yes, and, and one that I forgot to cover last week that okay. we can cover this week. Okay. So, yes. We have a full agenda then today. Yes, we do. So let's get on it. All right. What's new in economic data? Well, um... The, the big mystery thing right now is why have mortgage rates gone up? Mm. Okay. So mortgage rates had dropped mm -hmm. very close to 6%, you know, about 6.2%. And, you know, and then the Fed did their big 50 basis point drop on the discount rate. And so everybody's thinking, well, hey, we're heading in the right direction. There's talk of maybe two more uh, further mm -hmm. Fed, Federal Reserve rate cuts. Uh, and then this week, uh, mortgage rates went up to almost 7% again. And so uh, in doing the research, there are about five reasons given as to why it may have gone up, but nobody feels that any one of them would be responsible for such a big move. And I feel like this is a good time to remind people also that mortgage rates are tied to the 10 year well they they travel with the 10 year they travel with the 10 year treasury yes and so that's why they don't always do exactly what the fed does as far as the fed's rate cuts correct so the federal reserve discount rate is is what the overnight lending rate is for for banks to get money from the fed mm -hmm. uh so but it is a key benchmark that right. other debt instruments are based on. Now, interestingly enough, one of the reasons potentially given is uh, the markets are looking at the federal debt once again. Interesting, okay. And it was just announced that our federal deficit just hit $1.8 trillion and a trillion of that 1.8 trillion is debt service. So we talked about the deficit spending that the government has been going through on for many, many, many you know, decades now, right. but was really accelerated over the last four years with COVID and the different responses and whatnot. And now you have to go out on the markets, the federal government, and have incentivized people to buy that debt. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I think the markets are looking at is, are the feds going to have to pay a higher interest rate to potential bond buyers, particularly on 10-year notes, 
And then, of course, because there is that they move together, a mortgage response to that in anticipation that maybe the 10-year yield is going to increase. And so that's just one of many reasons okay. uh, given. But it, the timing was really odd. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we had dropped all the way down to mm -hmm. you know, six and a quarter, 6.2, and then to have it go up so quickly... Um, is is mystifying so a lot of this could be pre-election nervousness yep, the in, before the, election. in the market you we yeah. see the same thing going on in the stock market typically before elections uh and so in the bond market we might be seeing the same types of things and and so you know let, let's see what happens a week after the election and and then we'll really have i think a better idea also the federal reserve is meeting the week after the election or later in the week uh, of the election. So um, it'll be interesting to see what their comments are and, and whatnot. But uh, so this has been a bit of a head scratcher, not particularly great if you're in the home buying market right yeah. now. But as we all like to remind people, you know, marry the house, date the rate. Yep. And so you can always refinance downward once rates do, do drop down. And, and, Everybody's still forecasting that rates will come down. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of when and to what degree. Do you remember any of the other um, potential reasons of the rate going up yes. so much um, besides the 10-year and the debt? So uh, th these things include shifting election odds coupled with the assumptions about policy impacts, arcane calendar issues around uh, surrounding the options market, and one of several research notes regarding U.S. deficits that have been making the rounds. So I, I, I covered that part. Mm -hmm. So those were, and again, it, even this article says, frustratingly, nobody can put their fingers on which of these things. So I'm, I'm kind of putting it towards the pre-election nervousness mm -hmm. and some, you know, what, how how is the treasury going to handle the federal deficit and the financing of that so mm -hmm. i think those are the two two main things interesting okay yeah so we went um 6.85 is now the the rate as as of recording yeah so, that's a big jump and not a lot of time it was like in a week and makes planning difficult for buyers if they think they can afford a certain price of a house on say a base 6.2 rate potentially buying that down into the fives and then all of a sudden jumping up half a percent that that impacts affordability and what your new budget might be yeah so you know this is the difficult part about gambling on do you lock that mortgage rate when it hits a certain number Mm -hmm. um, knowing that could go further lower and are you leaving mm -hmm. something on the table, but then something like this, this can happen. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, while not mentioned here, but there's still the risk of global impact in the Middle East, right. in the Ukraine and Russia, you know, mm -hmm. those are your two major oil producing regions. Yeah. And, you know, it just takes one incident going off in one of those places and the rates go back up again because they're worried about oil shock and inflation and et cetera, et cetera. Right. I think so, it's also worth noting that some mortgage companies have a float down option. Um, if you were to lock in, say right after going under contract on a property, say you have a longer close, 45 day close, something like that. Some companies will offer a one-time float down if rates were to drastically decrease in that time that you're under contract. Now you're not gonna get the same decrease that you would as if you had locked on that lower amount initially, but right. it at least gets you closer to maybe what you could have gotten if you had gambled and hoped that they did decrease rather than increasing. Yes. So, yeah, we're not exactly leading with the, the best of news, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's kind of 
in, uh, we've been talking about wait and see, wait and see. Mm-hmm. I think the, the, I mean, we hear it from people that we talk to. Yeah. This election really has people on edge. It has the markets on edge. Mm-hmm. And so let's get past November 5th yeah. and relieve some of that tension. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we'll know on November 5th. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully Arizona can count ballots a little faster than they have in the past. So, yeah, that's that's get all I... Get your early voting in and... Get, uh, <laughs> yep, I have my ballot ready to be filled out. I finally got my ballot. It took a little while this time, but I swear mail just takes longer to get to my house anyway, so... Well, you are in unincorporated Pima County. Yes, yeah, so we're bottom priority. Is that what you're saying? Oh, well, you, <laughs> it makes it sound like you're way out in the, you know... <laughs> out in the boonies. Out in the boonies when actually right... You're right in between two mis- minus- min- municipalities. English as a foreign language is English. <laughs> wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have anything else on economic data or... So uh, another uh, interesting item, mm-hmm. uh, and it's kind of a fun thing that I read this week, um, October hiring for uh, short-term hiring for the primarily the retail industry mm-hmm. is b- pretty well correlated now with how well the Christmas season is going to go for retailers. So we will be looking in early November mm-hmm. at what the October uh, retail hirings look like, and that will give us a good indication of what retailers feel their Christmas season is going to be this year and it's pretty well correlated now and uh, so we can have a little crystal ball action in early November as to um, whether you know sales are going to continue to go up remain flat maybe see a decline I'm sure if the data comes out in time that's something that the Fed will want to look at prior to their November meeting yes absolutely and right now, unemployment and jobs numbers are a little skewed because of the two hurricanes that yeah. hit and some other things going on. So I'm, I'm not going to share necessarily that information this week because it's, you know, it's bounced back from those events. And so we'll just give it a couple of weeks and then take a look at w- where those employment numbers are. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that what you've got on that? that that's all I have on, on that. So it was mm-hmm. kind of a... It's just a weird week. Well, we're in that election lead up where not as much is going on. and True. We're kind of in the wait and see. Everyone's in the wait and see. Everyone's in the wait and see. So. Yes. Might have some more interesting things in a couple of weeks here. Yes. Well, I figured for my real estate side of things today, I would do a little uh, selling Tucson. Okay. Um, from what uh, Aunt Laura and I did this weekend um, when she was in town visiting. Um, so we ended up getting to go to two different places. Um, so we went down to the mission. So this is the San Javier del Bach mission. Okay. If you are in the area and people say the mission, this is the one that they're almost always talking about. Um, it's a little bit south of Tucson down I-19. Mm-hmm. Um, And so it's um, a Catholic parish um, on Native American land. And so there's a lot of kind of fusion of cultures and whatnot um, going on with that. And they have a museum that you can walk through as part of it um, as well that kind of talks about the history of the area um, and, you know, all the different countries that ended up basically ruling over this part of the country in not a very long time span between the Spanish, Mexicans, and then the, Amer- the U.S. Uh, mm-hmm. after the Gadsden Purchase. Um, so you get a little bit of kind of that history uh, to the area, um, a little bit of like the agricultural history. Um, the I think you said in one of our other videos that, that like 
the Tucson area is the longest known established um, agricultural. Yeah, continuously um, farmed. Yeah. Part of the of North America. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's really interesting to see. There's um, obviously the church that you can walk in. Um, they still hold masses there. And so if you wanted to attend a mass, you could attend a mass there. Um, but then there's the museum. And then there's also um, just a little trail kind of around. And being that agriculture has been part of our family, it's really interesting looking out. And you can just see how this was definitely an area that was farmed. Okay. Um, so I might have some pictures um, that I can send you. Of, that would be excellent. Of that. Um, the last time I was down at the mission, they were still doing some pretty major restoration work. And so there's still the scaffolding around it and everything, and that's all gone now. And so you can actually see it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's cool. pretty cool. Have you been? I have not yet you have been. You have not been? Okay. No. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely on my list of places I want to go visit. Yeah. Especially after going to Sevilla mm -hmm. and seeing the, the cathedral there. Yeah. And I know they're not the same thing. You'll see the influence, though. But but the, yeah. I'm the, I'm sure the Catholic influence is there. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I know it is. Uh, but to compare and contrast the European style versus yeah. the southwestern mission style. Yep. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, and it's free to get into. So if you're looking for a low cost activity, a little mm -hmm. history and culture, a little bit of history. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's be on your list of places to explore and then the other place that we went to is the mini time machine museum of miniatures it's basically the miniatures museum is how we normally refer to it as but the full name there okay <laughs> the mini time machine museum of miniatures um i believe that was 15 dollars a person to get into um for adults and then they have some discounts for you know college students and um, 65 plus, I think, and whatnot. Um, and we had about two hours there before closing, and we all decided that we needed more time than okay. that to spend there. The Just the level of detail on the different items was so cool. And if one, you know, really grabbed you, you could just sit there and stare at it for like 10 minutes. And then you still have this whole other museum to, you know, keep wandering through. Right. Um, and then they also have a rotating exhibit. So right now, um, their current exhibit is um, basically miniatures for Broadway. And so they talk about uh, like Hamilton and Dear Evan Hansen and some of those and how they basically use miniatures to build out their stage design and kind okay. of that work um, that goes into it when they're starting kind of the visual crafting of a play. Um, and so they have some of the early renderings and drawings that they use um, as they're creating their ideas for these plays. Um, and then they have a few videos to go along with it um, that are narrated and so. So what made you and Aunt Laura decide to go there? Uh, Aunt Laura had pulled up a few activities that she was interested in, mm -hmm. and mom and I didn't really have a big preference on any of them, and so she was like, okay, I think I want to do the mission and the miniatures, and I was like, fine by me. <laughs> I There wasn't wine tasting involved? Well, Kurt wasn't here. She said the one Kurt's here. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, have they been to Autumn Sage yet? Uh-uh. Okay. So, yes, it's on the list for next time. They might come again before the end of the year, so we'll okay. keep you posted on that one. Um, and then also in the minis right now, there's a like imagination fantasy wing of it. And I'm assuming this is a seasonal part. They have a Halloween part of it and a Christmas part of it. Okay. And so like there's this one area that has a bunch of buildings for a Christmas theme. And one that I noticed was they had a miniature of the Ryman Auditorium. Oh. And so I was looking, it's in the floor, one of those things that you can walk over and look down into it. And I was looking down like, the Ryman, I've been there. Yes. So um, that was pretty cool. There's 
you walk into that wing of it and there's this big tree um so, so is it just the ryman or is it like downtown nashville or? no it's a bunch of like individual different buildings and so i'm guessing that if you were like a big architecture person and knew these various buildings you would probably be able to recognize more of them i just saw that one because it had ryman written on it um but so, it was so, just a collection of, of so buildings real quickly for our our fans in Britain. We have some in Canada too. And but our Canadian, our, well, I, I think our Canadian fans might know what the Ryman Theater is, but but those that are, don't follow country music and aren't aware of the Ryman Theater, it was the original location of the Grand Ole Opry, yep. and it's a church, a mm -hmm. former church, and the acoustics in that building, accidentally or on purpose, are fantastic. Yeah. And so, um, for your 21st birthday, we went to Nashville for New Year's and had tickets to the Ryman Theater. Mm -hmm. um, one of their Christmas. For, yeah, for one of their holiday performances. Mm -hmm. And we got to see a couple of bluegrass performers mm -hmm. inducted into mm -hmm. the Grand Ole Opry. And, and yeah. their emotion was something else. It was like their 100th performance. Yeah, they'd been there a lot. Yeah, and so... Uh, well worth it. I mean, I, we, I haven't been to the, the current Grand Old Opry yet. I was back in college. I Did went. you go to the show? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know the sound. Yeah, you don't have a comparison, yeah. But the, uh, the sound in that Ryman Theater, Auditorium, Church. <laughs> auditorium. The only downside of the Ryman is, is the seats are... Oh, they're so they're not actual size, and I'm an actual size person. <laughs> and so uh, that is the only drawback of, of going to a performance there. But boy, yeah. did it sound good. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, if you know architecture and you go, tell me if <laughs> more of these are famous buildings that I just don't know. But I just don't know what, what they are. Yeah. But you recognize the Ryman, huh? But yeah, the Ryman is like, oh, yep, been there. Yeah, um, and then I think one of my coolest piece, one of the coolest pieces there, and I will um, send you this picture to include, on the like super minis. There's this artist who sculpts miniatures off of the ends of pencils. Oh, I think I have seen his work before, and that is fascinating. And this was another one that had a little like time-lapse video of him doing some of these uh -huh. and it was incredible and if you don't look closely and you're just kind of walking by you might not even realize that there's something on the tip of the pencil because it is so small i don't know how he doesn't lose half the pencil before finishing the carving by accidentally breaking stuff off but it was so tiny there was one that had a bird in a bird cage oh boy on the tip of a pencil it was incredible um so that was i think one of the pieces for all of us that stood out uh walking through there was just looking at, at these ones um but that was a cool place so you're saying well worth the 15 dollar admission yes and they and to give yourself more than two hours to really mm -hmm. enjoy it so they're open, according to Google, um, six days a week, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Yeah, I'd probably get like an early lunch and then go spend the rest of the afternoon there. Okay. Something like that. Um, All right. Because, yes, you could very easily pass more than two hours of time there. Okay. So, yeah, and I think you would like it too. So you might have to add it to your list of places to go to. Yes. Well, now that I can get out and about again. Yes. Yeah be better to do that okay so yeah so that was uh two of our adventures around tucson this weekend uh which was fun to do and you know get to be a tourist in your own town again which you know i think sometimes you live in a place for a little while and you forget all the things that are in your backyard until someone comes to visit and then reminds you of all the things that you can do yes now you've 
taken them up Mount Lemmon before or, or no? I don't think so. I, they may have been on the Sabino Canyon tram, um, but I don't know that they've gone further up than, okay. than that. Just because it's such a far drive from our side of town that we normally don't make it there. It is. Such a far drive being like an hour and a half. Yes. To two hours. Yeah. <laughs> However, uh, you know, for, especially from people from the Pacific Northwest where mm -hmm. we're used to driving through the mountain passes. And I remember we uh, took a friend of ours up there and that's what she thought it was going to be. It would be like going through the Cascade mountain range. Mm -hmm. And all it was was a continuous climb up and up with these mm -hmm. spectacular vistas and yeah. views and whatnot. And she was just gobsmacked. Yeah. A word you don't hear very often, but... Uh, I think one of my favorite parts about that drive up to Mount Lemmon, if you were to go do that, is that you can see the different basically layers of elevation and then the different vegetation that you get with that. Mm -hmm. And if you actually stop at some of the pull off spots along the way, there are placards that will tell you more about this. But basically, as you go up in elevation, it is equivalent to driving north, basically mm -hmm. along the west coast from Arizona up into Canada. And so they correlate the elevation that you've gone up to where are you now in the US and that's the type of trees and bushes and whatnot that you see and so you can literally see the layers as you go up yes the yeah mountain. yep yep all the way up to aspen trees at the top yeah yeah that type of thing yeah it, it's a it's a beautiful drive it takes time mm -hmm. and you want to take your time yeah i was gonna say especially if you're stopping and and yeah and I think that's one of those where if you can stay the night up there so that you don't have to worry about getting up and getting back in the same day, you're going to enjoy it a lot more. Um, staying at like the Mount Lemon Hotel or something like that, right. in one of their cabins. Um, and then you can take your time without feeling rushed. And then when you get up there, you can go to the cookie cabin and the general store and all of that. Well, I used to kind of make fun of the county here because every time it snowed up on Mount Lemmon, the roads closed. Mm -hmm. Again, Pretty thinking much. about going over a mountain pass in, in Oregon, and we, you know, rarely did we ever close the passes, uh, either the Coast Range or the Mount, or the Cascade Range. Once you've driven up Mount Lemmon, you understand why they close the road until they can make sure the road is fully secured mm -hmm. uh, with paving and sand or whatever else that they may put down because that is a steep and winding road. With big drop-offs. With very big drop-offs. Yeah. And so um, they're, they're not gonna mess around with people being foolish. Yeah, if you're a resident up there, you can get up there when the road closes, but if you're not a resident, then sometimes it's fully closed, sometimes it's chains or four-wheel drive vehicles, um, yeah. you know, only, and then other times it's, it's open, but they'll, I went up there one time after it had snowed a little bit, um, in a vehicle that could handle it, but they had, uh, police or sheriffs there at the base and they were talking to everyone going up and doing the, you know, be careful, you know, don't do this, don't do that reminders mm -hmm. for the drive up. Yeah. So yeah, well, okay, well maybe, maybe the next time Uncle Kurt and Aunt Laura in town, mm -hmm. we can cover that and go out to Sonoida for some Yeah, those length. are Who, I, well, opposite no, directions. I, I didn't can. mean the same day. <laughs> no, 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 those would be two separate day trips. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, no, no. Didn't you try to do that one time before? Or we had like talked about doing something sort of on that east side of town and like going up Mount Lemon and it was like. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, no, no not enough time to. Not gonna work. Do all of it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the midst of all of that, there was so much else going on. So I quickly jotted down all the things that I did not get to see live because I was busy all weekend. Okay. So I had F1, 
NASCAR, the WNBA Finals um, in Game 5, which went to overtime. Um, so that finished up this weekend. The Timbers um, tying up at Seattle to win the Cascadia Cup and mm -hmm. then um, get to host a home game of the playoffs. Um, college football, um, Georgia beating Texas, Tennessee beating Alabama, Oregon going number one in the rankings with all of that drama happening. And then I also had um, that the Eras Tour is back on, so Taylor Swift was in Miami, which meant I had surprise songs to check to see what got performed um, on those shows. And a new episode of Chicken Shop Date. Okay. There was a lot going on this weekend. Well, I can update you on a few of those things. Okay. So the only thing that I ended up later watching was F1. Okay. I did watch both sprint qualifying, sprint qualifying, and the race. So that is what, and I watched Chicken Shop Date. Okay. That is what I've made it to so far. All right. Well, um, I watched the Portland Timbers uh, play Seattle. Okay. Play the Flounders. Mm -hmm. um, not that we're biased or anything like that. Uh, I would say that, uh, well, Seattle has the, the best defense in MLS this year. Um, That's a bitter compliment to make. <laughs> yeah, well, they're also the team that, that you know, they're, they won their first MLS Cup without having a shot on goal during regulation. <laughs> so, sure. um, uh, yeah. so the first half was quite boring from a Portland Timbers fan perspective. Okay. And I can't remember if Seattle scored in the first, I think they scored at the very end of the first half. Um, okay. And then it was like a different team came out of the locker room in the second half and the Timbers were much more on the front foot, much more aggressive. The game opened up quite a bit. Um, I would say, even as a Portland Timbers fan, that. The referee was particularly harsh on uh, Seattle, and they have uh, Seattle has a young player who did a little time wasting. You know, kicked the ball away on a restart, got a yellow card, um, and then uh, you know got a little shoulder to shoulder thing with with a Portland Timber in the box and. Uh, he was called for a foul or something and he, you know, threw his hands in the air and had a big fit and when he got a second yellow card. So well, neither were really on pitch incidents no. that he got cards for. No. That's rough. Yes. And and you know, it was one of those where it's a rivalry game and the referee should allow for a little more emotion, mm. you know, when a player gets up, especially if they're already on a yellow card. And so they went down to 10 men and... and uh, yeah, I missed that. I didn't see anything about that. So. Yeah, and then Portland scored late to tie the game. And, and uh, they were already had secured their playoff uh, spot. Oddly enough, even though Vancouver should be hosting, mm -hmm. they have a, a stadium conflict. on, And so they'll be going down to Portland. And mm -hmm. Portland will be hosting the game mm -hmm. instead. Uh, but more importantly, uh, Portland won the Cascadia Cup, mm -hmm. which is a competition between Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, mm -hmm. going back prior to their even being in MLS. Mm -hmm. So it's a very old <clears throat> cup by North American soccer standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Portland won the cup. So mm -hmm. very exciting there. Yep. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a masterpiece of a game, okay. though. So... Uh, Portland's offense has gotten a little bit stagnant okay. the last three or four games. Yeah, because we were on a big scoring run for a good chunk of, what, like August? Yes, well, September. I mean, through most of the season, they were, they, it, the problem was they couldn't stop anybody from scoring. Mm -hmm. And and so, and, but now they're having a hard time getting the ball in the net. And so I'm, it's, it's not the kind of momentum you want to have going into the playoffs. Yeah. So on Formula One, real quickly, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say that the Circuit of the Americas, mm -hmm. commonly referred to as CODA, mm -hmm. is an excellent layout for Formula One cars. Yes. There are so many side-by-side -side opportunities yeah. 
and so many passing opportunities and they're, they have to be very precise as they're making these moves mm -hmm. in order to make the pass happen. It was a fun race to watch. I think as a whole, it was a good weekend. I feel like the race promoters have to be thrilled after getting the Daniel Ricciardo news, you know, three weeks before Coda and knowing what a big figure he is to F1 fans in the U.S. and then mm -hmm. to not have him there. I think the whole weekend was great with having the sprint race. You know, you get rid of those two extra practice sessions, which I always think when they kind of just come out of the box with whatever they've got after that first practice session, I think that less time fine tuning makes things a little bit more competitive sometimes. Yep. Um, and then you have racing action for the rest of that time. And so it makes it interesting. Well, and, and Ferrari inexplicably. English as a foreign language is English. Inexplicitly? Thank you. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, brought no upgrades in spite of having a month off and then finished first and second in, in the Grand Prix. Yeah. Uh, which nobody saw that coming. No. What was, what are your thoughts on the um, the overtaking off track rule and, and the FIA enforcement of how that is working, particularly on a track that doesn't have walls? Right. So uh, you know, I watched a lot of reaction videos to, to that race mm -hmm. and the way the rule book is written right now is that the car that is in front at the apex has the right to the corner. So the, the main thing we're talking about is Max Verstappen pushing Lando Norris off the track. Mm -hmm. Lando still made the pass, but he was penalized because he went off track to make the pass. Max also went off track, but Max understands that the rule is, it doesn't matter if I went off track or not, if I'm ahead mm -hmm. at the apex, so he dive bombs the apex to make sure his car gets a little bit ahead. Basically breaks super late. Breaks super late, because Lando was ahead, but mm -hmm. because Max broke later, got ahead, and then just drifted out with, with Lando. And there's nothing Lando can do. And nothing that Lando can do, and... Lando gets the penalty because he didn't give the spot back. Now, earlier in the week, or earlier in the race, George Russell got a penalty when he was in Max's position. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not sure that they ever went back and looked to see if he was ahead at the apex. I don't think he was. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, when he forced the other car off the track, he got the penalty for forcing that car off the track because he wasn't ahead at the apex. Mm -hmm. Had he dive bombed, yeah. he, could, he would have gotten away with it. So that's my frustration because I get that they're trying to be consistent in the rules and how they're applying the rules. But track to track, to me, makes this inconsistent. Because if that corner had a wall, like... Or a gravel pit. Or a gravel pit, yeah. Something to where the drivers clearly were not going to go off track. Max isn't going to dive bomb in the same way because if he doesn't leave Lando room and Lando goes in the wall, Lando's probably coming back to hit him and take him out as well. So yes. if this is, you know, Monaco or Singapore or someplace that's really tight like that, he's going to break sooner, give up the apex, and Lando is going to make that pass and keep it on track, and Lando's going to take the spot. So why is Lando not allowed to make that pass and gets penalized for doing what he would have done on a different track and it would have been allowed. That's the, what all the pundits are talking about, that, that Max very much understands his rule. Now, you could argue that Max should have been penalized on the first lap because he pushed Lando wide. Yeah. Lando had the apex, but... Max also knows that the stewards are going to be very lenient on the first lap. Yeah, and you can so, get away with it. So you can bunch. get away with it. Yeah. So, you know, as one of the commentators said, 
don't hate the player, hate, hate the rules, basically. Yeah. And he's exploiting the rules to the utmost. Mm-hmm. And the, the, you know, the conversation is, what is the FIA going to do during the off season yeah. when they go to rewrite the rules? That was my next question is, do you think there will be a change? Do you think this will be addressed? Or how do you... How do, is it, that's the thing is, how do you address this? Because they were addressing something else that Max was doing before by changing the rule to whoever's ahead at the apex. Right. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit like whack-a-mole. Yeah. You know, you, you solve this problem, another one's going to pop up because they, they're competitive drivers, they're competitive yeah. teams, and they're going to go after any advantage that they can get. Right. And right now, Max knows that if he dive bombs on the inside, and that, that basically that what that says is that Lando needed to position his car to yeah. the inside be before making the pass rather mm-hmm. than on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that's right. Right. I'm just saying that's what the rules that's say, how and it, that's yeah. how they enforce them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot going on in both that race and the sprint race. And I think what's interesting is that in both, basically, the leader sort of checked out mm-hmm. from whoever ended up leading at, at the end of the first lap. And it was like, okay, they've gone and done their thing cameras aren't on them oh it's the end hey they won and all the action was going on back in the pack and what because was there was on. lots of action going on in the back of the back yes yes yeah so i, I what i'm curious as a you know slight haas fan yeah haas had a really good weekend this weekend so they've moved into six points in the constructors uh competition i think there are a lot of u.s fans now that again daniel ricardo's not on v carb who are thrilled about them passing vcar because it's like they have no loyalty to the red bull 2 team no so it's going to be curious we've seen progress by that team all all season are they continuing are they becoming the leaders of formula b Mm -hmm. because they beat Aston Martin, they beat VCAR, they, yeah. you know, Aston Martin used to be part of Formula A. and They just they, had a terrible season. And I don't think Haas is going to catch them in the points. No. But. Not getting two points at a time. No, no. So it'll be interesting to see where that shakes out. I'll also say that Liam Lawson had an incredible drive. Mm-hmm. Starting at the back and getting points. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also was after not being in a car competitively for a year. Correct. And he he didn't care who he was racing with. It was elbows out, and he was going for it, and that was impressive. And beat his teammate. Yes. And Yuki was having a bit of a fit on the radio about yeah. how did that happen? <laughs> well, he just drove his tail off. Is how that happened. Yeah. And uh, made his tires last. Cola Pinto also had a points scoring weekend um, when Alex Albon did not. Yeah. And so that was another really good showing on his part. Yeah. Um, so I am curious as to if he's maybe getting a little higher in that discussion for that second um, Sauber slash Audi. Steak. Yeah, seat um, for next year. Boy, is that the seat you want to go into, though? I mean, that car is atrocious. It is. I, mean, I, I think it depends on how long your contract is. If it's a one year, probably not. Yeah, because I think one of the things that's going to come out of this with both Lawson, Calapento, Behrman, mm-hmm. all doing well as rookie drivers mm-hmm. this year is it showing that there's a lot more talent down in Formula 2 mm-hmm. than is being indicated because there's no dominant driver in Formula 2. And that's mm-hmm. you know used to be the guy that would get you know plucked out of Formula 2 into Formula 1. Now they're showing, hey, there, there are a lot of good talent down there, and maybe we can get rid of some of this, mm-hmm. you know, I hate to say it, but Deadwood. You mm-hmm. know, guys that have had their shot, their chance, haven't Are-pro- really... Performing. Yeah, and it's it's time to maybe turn things over a little bit. Well, when you had a season 
like the beginning of this one where you had zero turnover of drivers yep. from one season to at least the start of the next. That's another year of, you know, someone winning F2 who's not getting a seat. We've and already the, been they, stacking up on F2 winners not getting seats. Right. And if if you win F2, you don't get to race in F2 the next year. Right. That you're you're banned from the series. Yep. So then yeah. what do you do with yourself for e- that year? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you hope maybe I can you can be a reserve driver for one of the mm-hmm. bigger teams. But so that was exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be curious to see how the teams do in Mexico mm-hmm. next week. How do you think the track is going to treat the kind of the main four? Yeah, I don't know anymore, to, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, because Max had a, a great race, mm-hmm. both the sprint and, you know, quite frankly, the, mm-hmm. the longer race. You know, he, he got a podium. Uh, but Checo was nowhere to be seen again. Right. Obviously, Checo is going to race in Mexico. There's yes. financial... Incentives to make that happen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, McLaren's supposedly the dominant car, but they... If you don't qualify well, and they got in that dirty air, and, and they just had a hard time making passes... Yeah, and we've talked about that before, that they seem, to me, they seem more impacted by dirty air than some of the other teams. Yeah. Like, there's a bigger difference in how that car handles behind other cars versus once they're out in front. Yeah. I also think they don't do as well with a lot of slow speed corners. We've seen that at some of the other tracks. Mm -hmm. Um, When there's more of the heavy braking zones, slow speed corners, they seem to struggle a little bit more. That's just not their... Set up, yeah. Yeah. So. And you got the stadium section and a couple other slow turns in Mexico, but you also have some long straightaways. Which they seem to be doing well on. Yep. Yeah. I'm still baffled by Ferrari. Where did they get their speed from? It, yeah. It, every week they are either great or like, you know, right there kind of with Mercedes. And so it's, are you a third, fourth team or are you the first team yes and and so it makes me wonder instead of focusing on upgrades whether they said you know we have a good enough car we're just not getting everything out of it that we can dial it in more and they spent that four weeks on the simulator figuring out how to tune that car Mm -hmm. so that it performed it performed like we saw it perform at Dakota so yeah that's speculation on my part Mm -hmm. and then Mercedes it it is on such a knife edge to have mm-hmm. both um, Russell and Hamilton spin in the same turn different days. But it affected both of their weekends. Yes, it did absolutely, and and that car. You know, they, in NASCAR we have a term that you know when a car is really hard to handle, and it, we call it evil. Mm-hmm. The car is evil. I think that Mercedes is evil right now. Yeah, it seems like if they get it right and they get it perfectly right, they're real fast. Yep. And if they miss it by even a little bit, they're... Yeah. The, the, the their fourth. window is so small. Yeah. Whereas I feel like, uh, especially with McLaren, yeah. they have a larger margin of error yeah. and they can still get that car to perform. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm excited to have another race weekend. Yes. And then another one after that. Yes. <laughs> and then they, they nicely take the weekend off that we're going to be up at uh, the NASCAR race mm-hmm. in Phoenix mm-hmm. uh, so they can let us enjoy it and not feel like we're missing something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is true. Speaking of NASCAR. Speaking of NASCAR. One of the events that I did not get to see, although I did get to see who won, and when that popped up, I went, oh, it's going to be controversial. Yes. It <laughs> doesn't yes. matter what happened in the rest of the race, just the fact that Legato won and is into the final four after not being not in being the, in the final eight, eight until initially. Yep. Alex Bowman was disqualified mm-hmm. for being light at the Charlotte Roval. Yep. So not only did he get in 
quite frankly, by the grace of NASCAR's stewards, mm -hmm. <laughs> inspectors. And in, in last place. And in last place. But then now he's punched his ticket to the Final Four mm -hmm. because he won at Las Vegas. Which means they have a couple of weeks to work on setups for Phoenix because at mm -hmm. this point it does not matter how he does at either of the next two races. No points carry over. Correct. So they have work on Phoenix time. Yeah. Uh, now, mm -hmm. uh, they, they use strategery um, to, to win that race. Okay. And there was a, a moment in time with different cautions and whatnot where um, for track position, a number of the teams stayed out. Okay. So they were running on older tires. Joey Logano was one of them. Christopher Bell, who dominated the day. Easily, always flying under the radar. Always <laughs> flying under the radar, but easily the best car they chose to pit. And so they had to work their way through the field and track down. And probably two, three more laps, Christopher Bell would have mm. passed Joey. That's I mean, they were... You know, right there. Right there at the end. So do you think if he had stayed out that he would have won? He would have been able to stay ahead of everyone else? I think so. I mean, his car was so good and he was so dominant. Uh, the only other person that maybe could have really competed with him was Tyler Reddick, who won the first stage. Okay. And then shortly after the first stage, uh, rolled his car down the front stretch when uh, there were several cars got together, including Chase Elliott. And he went sideways through the grass in the infield and then got to the short track that cuts through the grass, tires dug in, rolled the car mm. several times. He intelligently drove it straight to the pits, but it was... It was done. It was done. It was too broken uh, to, to repair and get it back out. So he, he thankfully for him, he got stage points. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, you know, he finish at the back of the field for the rest of the race because, you know, he, his car was done. I'm looking at the um, point standings here right now, mm -hmm. and it feels like unless someone wins or we have some more, like, major incidents, there's a pretty big points gap already between the top four and the bottom four. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of Christopher Bell, he's up 42 right now. He's he's just dominating right. Now. I mean, he can have he can have one bad race, one and bad then race too. Yeah, and and then that puts him in in the danger zone. Mm -hmm. So um, he's going to be tough to beat. Mm -hmm. Joey's going to be tough to beat because they they're they're playing with house money now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they have to have the attitude of let's take advantage of this opportunity because we are gifted twice now. Yeah. I mean, they earned the win at Las Vegas. Don't get me wrong. They made a, a strategy okay. choice. Mm -hmm. uh, he executed it. And they know how many laps the race is. And he made it last long enough to, to get the checkered flag. Yeah. So, so two really good races from a fan's perspective. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you, you follow or, or you know, cheer on. Um, both both were eventful and exciting races uh, from a just a generic racing fan Family. perspective. Unfortunate that they overlap timing wise. Yeah, um, the the Cup race, the NASCAR Cup race, started a half hour before the Formula One race, and then finished about forty five minutes to an hour after the Formula One race. Um, because again, the NASCAR races are longer. So, um, yeah, that doesn't happen very often because normally Formula One's well done before NASCAR gets on the track. Right. So I was trying to find here. Five minutes later. I was trying to find there. Um, NASCAR had posted a graphic of, um, who had made the final four every year since the playoffs started. And the Joey Logano even years is just so funny. Um, 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to find well, it. Well, we talked about that last week. You know, yeah. It was like, it's an even year, and, and or maybe it was two weeks ago before he did get in. And he's, you know, he was struggling. And this was, this was an even numbered year. This is a Joey year. I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but yeah, might be able to find it later. Um, and it's just every other <laughs> yep. box on his whole play, uh, since NASCAR implemented playoffs. So. So do you have anything else? I didn't watch the WNBA, I can tell you that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't see um, any of that. I just saw that it went into overtime. Um, did you watch any college football this weekend? Not a lot uh, hmm. because I was, you know, they had the sprint race for Formula One and they had the Xfinity race, which I did watch. Um, nothing or shattering went on in, in that race. So I didn't watch a lot of college football. Um, it just seemed like there was a lot going on there with some big matchups between ranked teams. Well, and with the expansion of the SEC, the Big 12, the Big 10, mm -hmm. there are a lot more competitive teams. You no longer have mm -hmm. two or three teams that are dominant. You now have five or six. Yeah. And so you're, you're going to see really good teams get knocked off. Mm -hmm. They're uh -huh. feeling the pain that we always felt in the Pac-12 where no team could ever get all the way through their season without dropping to someone. Yes. And because it was the Pac-12, that always meant, oh, not in contention anymore. Right. And right. now with these big conferences, everyone else gets to feel that. Yes. And, you know, they're talking about in 2026, you're probably going to see another series of conference alignments. Already the former Pac-12 uh, teams are not thrilled about the travel. Shocking. It's like no one looked at a map before they did this. Yes. Yeah, or had never flown cross country before. Yeah. Well, and can you imagine, you know, a sport that's not football where you have multiple games a week and mm -hmm. that level of travel for, you know, like the soccer's, volleyball's, basketball's, where you're playing a lot more that's yeah. so much travel yeah basketball is going to be really tough and then to be a student on top of that i mean in suppos theory it's supposedly yeah yes um well if you're at stanford yes <laughs> yes that is true <laughs> and then and you're they're, going they're all, they're all going all the way over to the acc so yeah. they they that's coast to coast yeah 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 i it will be interesting um come a couple years from now and see how this all shakes itself out again and yeah. hopefully Oregon State and Washington State hang on long enough to get looped back in when all of that happens. Right. They're, they're, they, they need one more school to have a reconstituted Pacific Conference. Right. I won't call it the Pac-12 because there won't be 12 teams in it. And there used to be a time when actually those numbers meant something. <laughs> right. <laughs> but Actually, it did for... Pacific Conference, right? Because it went 8, 10, 12. Exactly. So, yes. One it, conference kept the tradition of numbers meaning something. Yes. But <laughs> not, not the rest. Yeah. Yeah. So, I forgot to talk about the Post Malone mm, music okay. piece. You had introduced the concept about a month ago that you uh, listened to the album. It was more than a month ago now, but yeah, continue. Well, you know. <laughs> Time compresses as you get older. So I listened to most of it. I can't say that I listened to all of it because I was doing it via YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I had some thoughts. Okay. My, my first thought was a lot of the songs have a very over-amplified guitar, you know, where it's to the point of distortion. Mm -hmm. And it made me wonder if that was a Post Malone sound. Mm -hmm. And then watching a totally different video on the, like the top 25 or 100 most iconic songs that you recognize interesting uh, immediately. Well, one of them was a Post Malone song. Okay. And the little clip that they played of it had that same overamplified, distorted guitar sound. And I found it annoying. Okay. 
So that's and not it, your style. It's not my style. And and the reason I found it annoying is not I'm not just the old man get off my lawn <laughs> type thing. Get off my lawn. But lyrics in country music are very important. Right. And it was distracting me from the lyrics okay. of the songs. Mm-hmm. So out of that whole group that I listened to, I found two songs that I, I particularly enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them was uh, a, a, an acoustic guitar song about his daughter called mm-hmm. Yours. Mm-hmm. And I, I it's gonna be a wedding song at some point. It's going to be a wedding song. I feel like every country artist has to have their wedding song at some point in He knocked it out at the first first album, <laughs> yeah. so so it's not a problem. And then the other song that I really liked was the one that he did with Dolly Parton. Okay. And it was a more traditional mm-hmm. country song. And uh the the hook in the song, the the lyric hook I just loved was baby I don't have the heart to break yours mm. and it, it's it's such a cliche cliche country type line mm-hmm. but again uh, it was more in the style of traditional country I think probably Dolly had some influence on that mm-hmm. and I, so. I enjoyed that song a lot and so those were my two favorites okay. um, and then there were a couple fun party songs they right. did, you know, with like Blake Shelton and and Morgan uh, Wallen, Morgan Wallen, and Luke Combs and whatnot. But again, they still had that that guitar undertone mm-hmm. that just took it from. I don't think those are going to be long lived country songs. Interesting. I think yours has the potential to mm-hmm. be long lived. I think anything that you do with Dolly has the potential for being long lived, and so. So that was anyway. That's my my post Malone, who had never heard of the guy before you <laughs> yes. brought it up. Um, so so I come with a completely blank sheet of paper. Mm-hmm. Now some of the videos I enjoyed because uh, there was a series of them that they shot in the studio. Okay. And so there's often commentary from him after the song is over oh interesting okay and you know like one of them you know he's just raging about the steel guitar player and what a bang up job the steel guitar player did um so you know interesting so so a little behind the scenes personality that you get to see with him that yeah so my the big thing that I noticed was that I felt like the collabs felt like those songs could belong to the artists that the collab was with. Mm-hmm. Did you feel that also? Certainly. Uh, particularly, uh, I think the Blake Shelton and Brad Paisley mm-hmm. songs, to me, and to a certain extent, uh, uh, Tim McGraw. Mm-hmm. Um, those, those three really resonated with me. Obviously, Dolly had her her thumbprint is clearly on that one. On that one. Mm-hmm. So I, I get those. Mm-hmm. Um, Morgan Wallen, yeah, I, I can yeah. see that. Uh, Luke Combs, not quite as much. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's, it it doesn't sound like Luke Combs because you know they're he's obviously in it, but uh, okay. so you felt that a little bit as well. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I still think I was more annoyed by the guitar sound, though, than mm-hmm. than I was like, yeah, this sounds like a Tim McGraw song. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Although I would say Tim McGraw probably, I, if I remember correctly, had less of that guitar impact. Okay. So more of Tim McGraw showed through in that song than some of the other collabs that he was doing. Yeah. Makes if that sense. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yes, and this is a guy that that you know knows what he likes, but but 
had, doesn't have the vocabulary to describe <laughs> <laughs> what it is. Yeah. So, so Fun fact, you know, we have you know, no you know, if, musical if, talent if, in this duo right here. Yeah, none. And so, <laughs> we you know, will not be performing karaoke. We, um. we will not be insulted if you in the comments <laughs> say, well, the phrase that you're looking for is this to describe what you are hearing. We will not be offended, and if you can educate <laughs> others in the comments, that that's fine because whew, that, that 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 was a hard hard segment for me to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's one of those things that I'd love to be really good at. But whew, thanks for the poor genetics on that one. Well, you got it from both sides of the family, yeah, though. Yeah, I, I know. mean, you got a double barrel of of non musical talent. Although Grandma Donna played piano. Well, and your mother played the flute. Yeah. So this is more <laughs> your side. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Because there's no one on your side that's musically no, it, inclined. It does my heart good every time you get to hear Grandpa Dave sing. <laughs> because you like you know exactly where that came from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we're lip sinkers in church, you know. <laughs> yeah, do not ask us to do karaoke. We will not. There's a reason. You don't want us to do it. Just don't. Yeah, don't it's even painful. try. It's painful for the listener. It's painful for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, what else do we... Let's move on from... <laughs> okay, the, so... The lack of talent. <laughs> so, chicken shop date. Yes. Now, you, you told me a little bit about this the okay. other day. So you've never I've, heard of this, never seen this, despite the time that you spend on YouTube? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so Chicken Shop. I mean, I, I have seen the videos of, you know, First We Feast, uh, which is the Hot Wings oh, yeah. videos. But no, I have not seen this chicken one. Chicken Shop. Okay. So there is some similarities, I'd say, between this and... Um, hot ones um, you know they're both typically with celebrities it's interview style it's just hers is set in your like classic greasy chicken diner okay. type of restaurant as a date quote unquote okay um, and she has like a very British dry um, sarcastic i would say sense of humor okay and that heavily comes through in a lot of her episodes um and she has actually been doing this for 10 years now so she just celebrated 10 years of doing it um so the idea of yet another overnight youtube uh, sensation mm -hmm. yes that has been doing it for, for 10 years mm -hmm. yeah exactly um so this one was with andrew garfield um of like Spider-Man. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. World. Um, one of the many Spider-Men. Um, and you sort of have to know the history behind this. So she's done some like red carpet correspondence previously. Okay. And has run into him and talked to him there. And there's always been like some chemistry and like a little bit of underlying tension between them and, and all of that going on but he had not been on the show and so finally made it on and it was like okay is this actually a date that we're all sort of <laughs> get to watch watch that we're all like should we be watching you're, this uh, right now well, uh, <laughs> look at it as you're a chaperone <laughs> yeah. yeah so you know a lot of the time it is more interview style of her asking them questions this one felt more conversational back and forth. He was flipping some things back on her and asking her questions. And so that just made for a little bit of a different dynamic. And so in the last several days, as more you know, pieces of it have been coming out and whatnot, um, everyone's like, okay, is, is there going to be you know, a hard launch of this at some point? Is this real? Or are they just both very good actors? But it's like 10, 11 minutes long. It's not very long. Um, but okay. if, you, if you watch the red carpet um, interviews beforehand and then go watch the date, it will all make more sense. Um, so you are calling it a date? 
Chicken Shop Date. It's the name of the show. They're all dates. It's just some okay. are. Yeah. <laughs> some are more. Yeah. Than others. Okay. So yeah, uh, spend you know fifteen minutes and go watch that. And it was it was all interesting. Right. So we will see if um, anything comes of it. But yeah, the the British humor um, sometimes it's like oh yeah, this is <laughs> this is different. <laughs> okay. So yeah. All right. That was. Um, one thing that I almost got to watch in real time, I think I was only like an hour or two behind on watching that when it came out on Friday. So, nice. Yeah. I think I've run out of things to talk about, except for I do want to say one thing. Okay. So, if I remember, mm -hmm. and this will remind me, because when I see this one, I'm <laughs> editing, I'm going to put up some QR codes mm. at various times throughout the video. You're going to be all fancy. I'm going to be all fancy. Okay. And so we, we don't often talk about the fact that in the description below, mm -hmm. we have several links mm -hmm. uh, to help you out real estate wise. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, a general search for the homes for sale in the Tucson area. Yes. If you are of the active adult living uh, category or 55 plus, mm -hmm. age qualified. Um, we have a search down there for that as mm -hmm. well, so the, the different 55 and over communities here in the Tucson area. Mm -hmm. But we also have a first time home buyer's guide. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a home buyer's guide yep. and we have a, a seller's, a home seller's guide. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're always in the description. In the description yep. below, every week we, we put them down there. Sometimes it's a little, it, for example, I watch most of my YouTube on my big screen TV. Mm -hmm. So for me then to go look up a video and find the description and click on the link. Not something that you do very often. Not terribly convenient. So what I'm gonna start doing, and I'll label them, is putting up little QR codes. Mm -hmm. So for the, five to 10% of you that watch on the big screen, you can just take a photo of that um, QR code and it will take you to those different documents or searches mm -hmm. um, for you to use. So that's gonna be new mm -hmm. in the videos going forward. I'm just gonna to try to remember to make sure to put them in. Yes, if you are actually watching rather than just listening on, on one of podcast. our podcast yes. platforms. Yes, absolutely. So. And again, even in um, the podcast descriptions, yes. we have included those links as well. Which is definitely easier to find there because you're already in that section when you're yes. going to the podcast. So Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So I, I wanted to remember to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're looking for that sort of information, we've got it. And you're you know, at this point, you've probably already have seen them and was maybe wondering why I was putting those up there. So now you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Do you have anything else that you're looking forward to other than more racing this weekend? So more racing, uh, you know, we, we uh, still have our listing that we're working on and we mm -hmm. meeting uh, some new clients tomorrow to take mm -hmm. them to go see that. So looking forward to that. Yep. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's getting crunch time on a number of things, and so we, you know, my days are getting full, and uh, <laughs> and so um, a lot of work we're going to be doing yes. this this coming week. Yep, I think so. How about you? Haven't looked that far ahead. Full days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So uh, with that, yep. please like and subscribe. Mm -hmm. Hit that notification bell if you'd like to know when the next one of these comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also listen to us on these different <laughs> sources for podcasts. Mm -hmm. Also, you can come to our, our website and listen to it there because we have a link to our mm -hmm. podcast there as well. Do. Lots of options. Yeah, if you can't find us, that's a you problem at this point. Yes. <laughs> We've done all we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, you know, um, I watched a video um, this week. Yeah, I, I, you thought we <laughs> see we 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 fooled you again, but it's, it's relevant. It's relevant to this topic. Okay. 
And it was uh, a YouTuber that I occasionally watch. Oh. And she went back and watched her very first video because she had just hit, I think, 100,000 subscribers. Okay. And so it got to the end and she goes, oh, I haven't worked on an outro yet. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious I haven't done that. Well, you know, it took me a little while to figure out what I'm going to say. We're still working on that. Um <laughs> And so, if you have any suggestions for us <laughs> to better and more gracefully exit out of these things, please let us know. Put them in the comments down below because we are definitely struggling. Uh, yeah. I was about to wrap it up and then you had more to say. Well, I had a tangent. You know, we talk about when that synapsis fires mm -hmm. up there. I, I just mm -hmm. got to go with it sometimes. Yeah. Are we done with... I I'm done synapsizing. <laughs> made up word was that <laughs> oh my gosh okay well i think we are officially done now so with that we will see you next week have a great rest of the week <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> oh